for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. I'm sorry to get away from their questions, but I wondered about this. So what about the numbers of the people? Like, do you think it really, don't, don't, don't creation say it like doubled and doubled or something like that? Yeah, I, I mean, if you actually take back the number of people we have today, um, once you start going back far enough, it's really hard to track genealogies because then we're all so closely related. For example, there's been so much intermixing, interbreeding, but the population growth rate really does just go back to 4,500 years. Evolutionists oftentimes have to invoke extinction events or plagues or other types of factors to account for their date of 200,000 years for the out of Africa. But yeah, the population fits quite nicely with the young earth creation time scale. What about those extinction events in the creationist model? Yeah, there would have been, well, for example, there would have been a near extinction event with the flood, that would have been a population bottleneck. The creation model has essentially three bottlenecks. You got a bottleneck at creation with Adam and Eve, a bottleneck at the flood with eight people, and then a brief bottleneck at the Babel. The, um, the thing with the creation model bottlenecks though is they were all one generation and they were followed by rapid and exponential population growth. Therefore, there wouldn't be any inbreeding problems. There wouldn't be any significant loss of that original created heterozygosity. Now, if you get into the evolutionary population bottleneck, which was extended for over a thousand years um, within a population of two to 10,000. Now there would have been some significant e inbreeding problems, which would result in rapid genetic degeneration. So bottlenecks and extinction events are a problem for uh, the evolutionists. And, and unfortunately, Katz and I didn't get to discuss that too much, but I did discuss it in my opening. Mm -hmm. So good question. Yeah. Katz, do you have anything you want to say about that? Uh, no, I think when we, you know, we talk about inbreeding, I, I don't understand how how you can you can address a bottleneck and say that's going to cause inbreeding problems when you claim that you've got three people stepping off the ark and, and producing an entire population you know mm -hmm. um i think if we're going to talk about inbreeding that's going to happen because like i said before just it is, it's totally impossible for the, a small number of people stepping off one boat to have all of the variation all the alleles needed for the variation today uh, and if they did start to breed the inbreeding would be more severe than anything we've seen uh anywhere but then it only takes one bacterial cell, you know, to, to produce uh, an entire uh, colony. So, you know, who knows, but how, how, how much variation is doing that colony? Not a great deal. Um, and of course they, they were produced by a different, different method anyway. So I don't know why I'm waffling on about that now. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's nonsense. The, you know, the inbreeding that will be caused by two or three people stepping off an arc is, is ridiculous. Well, uh, just to respond to that real quick, I guess, because it is an interesting point that you made. I do want to emphasize that according to our model, the 7 billion people on the planet today descend from ultimately three founding couples, Noah's three um, daughters-in-law and Noah's three sons, for example. Fascinatingly, we see three main mitochondrial DNA lines around the globe on every single continent, L, M, and N, so that evolutionists will just say that's a, um, that's a coincidence, but it's, it's fascinating uh, confirmation of that model. But that that's more than possible because we don't explain the vast majority of DNA differences as a result of mutations. And I feel like I got to say that over and over again. We explain the vast majority of DNA differences as a result of created heterozygosity. That means uh, there would be no inbreeding problem because evolutionists explain the vast majority of DNA differences as the result of mutation. So by the time you reach the out of Africa scenario, you've got the Australopithecines evolving into Homo erectus. Homo erectus evolves into Homo sapiens. Sapiens, for example, or Homo sapiens. There's been so many generations of mutation accumulation that by the time you reach that bottleneck, now you've got all these recessive mutations that are coming to the forefront, leading to rapid genetic degeneration. But inbreeding is the uh, exposing of the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. In the creation model, up to the flood, there wouldn't be any accumulation. There'd be a few, but very little accumulation of genetic mutations and genetic mistakes. So if there's no mistakes to um, to lead to a significant inbreeding problem, there wouldn't be 
an ingredient problem like there would be with the evolutionary bottleneck. But if those DNA differences are front loaded from the start, then therefore processes like recombination, gene conversion, shuffle around those DNA differences could produce variety rapidly, even in a single generation that goes for the right. archives as well. So it's, uh, but it's, it's a model that leads to testable predictions and that's what needs to be addressed is the prediction. Yeah, that's, 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 I would, and I know this is a question thing. I'll just say one thing on that and then I'll, I'll leave it. You know, it, back in sort of like, you know, testable prediction, where, where do we see in breeding? You know, we look at selective breeding, don't we? We look at selective breeding, which is what humans and, and, and uh, farmers have been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. And with selective breeding, uh, which is a form of inbreeding, we breed out. We breed out the variation and we get similar. We don't breed in variation. We don't have seven people step off an arc, inbreed and create variation. Selective breeding where we, we have, you know, we have a, a, a small number of organisms and we are breeding them together. It, it reduces variation over time. So it's not just about accumulated mutations, which can then come to the front. It's about a reduction in variation, uh, going out and meeting other people who've got, who are very different to you. And that, that's how variation is, is spread as well as mutation. Inbreeding will reduce it. Well, that's actually a good point because... Um, as creationists, since we believe in the created heterozygosity hypothesis, we look back to the creation event and we see the expansion of the genome because these changes, these speciation events have resulted from shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity, which means uh, uh, reduction in, in variation. That's why when we look to species today, for example, we can look at the seven living equid species. They have more homogeneous gene sites than they do heterozygous, which makes sense according to our model because um, we're looking at reduction in uh, genetic variation. You can see that with two wolves. You can see that with dog breeding. For example, uh, two chihuahuas are not going to have very much allelic uh, variation. They're not going to have much genetic potential. And what I find funny, and this will be my last point, is like I said with the, with the equid species, you're, you've got um, seven altogether. I believe it's three species of zebra, one wild horse species, three wild asses. Now, when it comes to the breeds, we've got over 850 breeds of horses and donkeys in the world today. And the evolutionists will even admit that these breeds have come about through in human history because they've been created through the recombination, for example, shuffling around those DNA differences, resulting in new variation. This has been done by humans. Now, evolutionists will say that those seven little itty, itty bitty species of equids took, I believe it's um, four million years for those seven to come about, but they will even agree that it only took thousands of years for the 700 plus breeds to come about, but then they think there's a huge problem. Oh, well, I have. A, I wanted to ask another question because somebody, a few people have asked about this. Um, about it's a study that I, they want to know if you've seen it. Um, standing for truth, the of course, 20, yeah. 2017 UF study: snail kite bird evolves virtually overnight to keep up with invasive prey in Gainesville, Florida. Have you seen that? It's speciated literally overnight, is what it said? Um, it's virtually it evolved virtually overnight. I don't know the study, so I don't know what it says. It, it's very interesting because right? we've got we've got future testable predictions on speciation rates. We look at, for example, there's only about 10 to 12,000 bird species. We take that back 4,500 years to the flood. That's roughly two to four new bird species a year. Therefore, we should be expecting to see observed um, new species of bird in real time. And just last year, it was um, a paper came out where there's been a new species of Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands in real time. And what's funny is the speciation event uh, resulted from shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity just has been predicted based on this created heterozygosity hypothesis. So what I find funny, and, and if Katz wants to respond, he can, evolution would say that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs roughly 65 million years ago. Right. Why are there so few bird species today? 10 to 12,000 species. This also goes for lizard species, uh, snake species. There's only a few thousand species um, per um, like creature, for example. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. You can have a word there if you want to cast. Well, just, just on speciation, uh, I know you were talking about birds, and I know insects didn't go on the ark, um, but there are millions, and, and I presented this argument to Kent Hovind, there are millions and millions of species of insect, and we will be needing, uh, you know, 
I think I calculate what well, I got my slide here. Three or four new species of insect a week. Um, yeah. you know, so we so yeah, you, you know, you might be able to find one species that fits, but and that's based on six thousand years. And that was just using uh flies, wasps, please bees, uh be kind, because I included bees and wasps get um and aphids. You know, that was just using those as an example in the calculation, which I, I can put in a video if you want. But yeah, when we look at insects, um, you know, yeah, we, we, we're looking at almost on a daily basis, we, we should be seeing new new uh, insects, which we just don't see. So yeah, the speciation rate is wow. way too high. How come there's so few bird species, like I said? Um, if if uh, birds evolve from theropod-like dinosaurs, yeah. 65 million years ago, why do the number of bird species between 10 and 12,000 correlate so well with the young earth creation? Two words, extinction rate. Right, I knew you were gonna say that. What, what kind of predictions can you make on ex extinction events? How many extinction events? How, how fast are these speciation rates? We've observed in real time last year, a new species of bird. The number of species, insects, there's only a, a 1 million species of insects. That includes everything that you've, You've explained insects survive a flood, no problem. Insects Do they? Can How? insects can just make their way onto the ark, no problem. That's easy. But when it comes to yeah. like mammals, reptiles, and birds, I'm talking here. Relax. Don't, don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. Don't do Thirty-four thousand species. For example, lizards and snakes. I don't have the exact data here. Um, there's only about. Um, for bats, there's 1,100 species. Lizards, I believe there's 4,000. Snakes, there's about 4,000. That's one new species per year. The species that we see do not correlate with deep time evolution. They correlate much better with young earth creation time scale. And Anthony here just proved his non-science and his post hoc ad hoc ridiculous rescue devices because you oh extinction events. Show me some testable predictions on, on extinction events that though, or that's just non-science and rescue device. Go ahead. Right, I mean, look, at the end of the day, you've picked a species or you picked a bird and that seems to fit your thing. Ultimately, it just doesn't. I mean, I, I presented this argument in a 20-minute part of my debate with Ken Hovind. And, you know, there's more. I could talk about rabbits. I could talk about oh, rabbit kind, beetle kind. We need How a new species of rabbits every week. Uh, species of rabbit. So let me just go back there. Um, <laughs> now, that depends whether you want to talk about rabbit or rabbit and her kind. We need to see a new species of uh, rabbit uh, every two years, and we need to see. Uh, oh, yeah. breeds or species? Say that again, sorry. Is that a combination of species and breeds, or just species? We're, we're talking about species, actual different species, not not breeds and species. Oh, and I, I, don't I, looked up, I looked up your slide after, and you accidentally included breeds in your in your with rabbit species. Once again, there's only a few that correlate nicely with the young Earth creation time scale. You can't include that. Would be like me including the equid species, the living seven in the wild, with the 850 breeds. Breeds are easy to come about. Humans do it naturally. You got to look at that that which is in the wild, cat. So you might want to define that. a breed. How do you define a uh, because when I'm talking about, uh, yeah, go on, how do you define the breed? Definitely breed developed right. through artificial selective means from humans. That, so obviously they came about during human history. So the rabbit species in the wild, there's only a few. There's only a few species of rabbits. There's only a few species of birds, lizards, snakes. Every animal you can point to fits well with creation. Uh, Wait a minute. You, are you saying, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I'm sorry. trying to follow. I'm just trying to follow, babe. So are you saying that humans make breeds of everything? Like, are we, what? So by definition, breed versus species, okay? There's a difference between like your um, Canis coyotes, Canis familiaris, you know, all your different species of dogs versus your 450 breeds. The breeds have been artificially okay. selected from humans. They've done the job. That's, you know, just through sh reshuffling of these genetic DNA differences. The species in the wild, those are the ones that we need to explain how they came from the flood. Right, I thought and you were talking about every animal, not just dogs. It wouldn't make any sense when you're saying, oh, you need over 300 rabbit species. No, because most of those are breeds. Those came about from human means anyways. Oh, okay. It's just a species. And you, add, you, add to, you add to that, because you, you talk about kinds coming off the ark. So it wouldn't just be the rabbits. It will be the rabbits and her, because that will be the same right. kind. as defined by Kent Hobin. And then if you talk about kinds, you add the pika to that as well. And that's what I was doing, you know, so... Unless you want to talk about rabbits as being one animal, 
hers being another, P could be another, in which case they are all on the arc together. And if we start doing that with animals, then suddenly the, the arc becomes too full because no ship can carry them. In 2014, a group of master students at Lesta University decided to settle the question. They used the biblical measurements to calculate the size of the arc. Then they used the density of the water to figure buoyancy, and from there, determined how much weight the ship could endure before sinking. Their conclusion? Noah could have put 70,000 animals on board and the ship would have floated. And what do you know? It floats! So, it, it, well, we're talking about the speciation from a kind, in which case the speciation rate is unbelievable. Or are we talking about speciation from all the animals we've got anyway, you know, um, which means, you, do you know what I mean? Like, which means... Well, the, the when it comes to, by rule, by definition, species and breeds, there's always more. There might be a few um, cases, but, you know, the majority proves the rule. There's always more breeds than there is species. The species are very limited. Now, when you look to this idea, it's very simple. When you look to this idea of pre-existing diversity, okay? So, for example, let's take the cat ancestor aboard the ark. There's only about 37 cat species in the wild, okay? So, say that this cat ancestor was front-loaded with a whole bunch of functional DNA differences at creation. Now, these front-loaded functional DNA differences has led to the origin of species. For example, you've, Noah brings two cats. Now, we've got everything from tigers to house cats to jaguars. And in between, if you look to dogs, same thing applies. You've got everything from wolves to coyotes to jackals and foxes. Kind, and you're, about the cat, you, you're not talking about taking species on there. You're talking about taking kinds on the Right. So, so Noah yeah. would have taken, let's say Noah took two bears. Now, th those bears would have originally been front-loaded with all these functional DNA differences. It's led oh, yeah. to the origin of species. Now we have black bears, brown bears, polar bears. And as a matter of fact, all eight species of bear. Like eight species hey, bear. of bear is not hard to explain, yeah. is my point. What I'm saying, if you take kinds on the arc, then the speciation rate has to shoot up rather than taking species. And, uh, I mean, again, it's something maybe I'll put in another video. But, uh, you know, I will politely say that you are just massively wrong with that the speciation rate if you're taking kinds is way way i mean there are 350,000 different species of beetle alone now that means that we need one species of beetle you can go to insects and avoiding mammals and reptiles and amphibians why is there only eight species of bear why is there only 37 species of cats all right but your model should have to fit to every single organism you just, you know, like 350,000 species of beetle and we took one kind on the ark then, and I'm just looking at my slide now that I used, that calculated over 6,000 years if we didn't put them on the ark because they're an insect, we need a new species of beetle every single week. And we're, and, and we're not getting a new species. Bees only live, so when bees live a few months, a queen lays thousands upon thousands of eggs. There's only a million species of insects. Like I said, they can survive a flood easily. They can survive on log mats. They can survive in the ark just by going there on accident. When we focus on the 34,000 mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, there's so few for deep time evolution to be true. That's why just like Anthony uh, proved to us here, you have to result to a, a, a rescue device of extinction events. No, all we do is linear speciation events since uh, the flood 4,500 years ago, easily explains the number of bird species, reptile species, mammal species. I just showed that it's consistent with your cat species, your bear species, your dog species. We're the ones making the predictions. Evolutionists can't. I